Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arup, for allotting me this very important topic. And uh, Dr. Arup has been my mentor throughout, so thank you for that also. Sudden intraoperative anti-chamber shallowing is something which we need to brace ourselves every day. And I'll acknowledge the help of Dr. Sayan Das and Sushrutai Foundation for the video that they have lent. Let me walk you through a case being done by a trainee surgeon. There was a supervising surgeon also, but let's see the sequence of events. This is a fairly nice anterior chamber, you'll agree. So that's how the case started. Now, after the then viscoelastic, so that's a fairly well-formed anterior chamber, no doubt about that. So now hydrodissection, and our surgeon is struggling now. The anterior chamber is shallow. He's trying to push it back. There is not so very little fluid coming out, so it is a struggle now. It's getting difficult now, the trainee. Now, the next step, another attempt at hydrodissection and the iris prolapses. This is an ominous sign that the anterior chamber is shallow and we are in for trouble. So now no amount of reposition is going to help. This is when we need to take a call. So now we have a shallow anterior chamber and the iris is prolapsing. What is the next logical step that we're going to do? Anybody? I want you to run yourself through this case and what will you do? So when we'll have the discussion at yeah, the end I'm, of the I'm talk? Yeah, just, I'm just asking them to think. We will. So, now, the first thing you need to do is check the pressure of the eye, whether it's soft or hard. That is the key to the next step and how big a trouble you are in. If it's low, there's an inflow-outflow mismatch, you need to correct that. If it's high, it's called a positive pressure, it needs urgent at attention and you need to assess the cause. It could be external forces, fluid misdirection, or supracoronal effusion or hemorrhage. All three need urgent attention. Excess flow could be because of leaking paracentesis, high flow rate, insufficient because of obstruction of the phaco sleeve or inadequate bottle height. And this is where is the big problem is mechanical pressure, tight speculum, drapes, or retrobulbar hemorrhage, fluid misdirection, supracoronal effusion, and supracoronal hemorrhage, with which Dr. Mina has alluded to so well. Now, remember, this is something very important we tend to ignore. The anterior chamber has only 0.22 ml of fluid, aqueous or whatever fluid. That's your, what you're playing around, so that's what makes a lot of difference. You may inflate it and make it twice, but that's also 0.44. So the corrective measures. Correct, these are standard things which you know, wound leak, loosen speculum, identify a of hemorrhage. This digital IOP is still high. Either you are dealing with a Overfilled capsular bag, which has been an overzealous hydrodissection, or a fluid misdirection, or a supracoronal effusion or hemorrhage. Now, these are the various names by which it's been known. There is something which has come into the literature recently in 2014 ish acute intraoperative rock high, hard eye syndrome. Uh, I would recommend that you all read it. And it's also called acute aqueous misdirection syndrome. It's basically what was called malignant glaucoma in the post op period, is what we see in the, during the surgery, is what is called fluid misdirection. The bottom line is the anterior chamber is shallow with an interoperative rigid eye without a supracoronal effusion or hemorrhage and needs inter immediate intervention. How does it work? There is what is called a vitreous valve or a capsular, the zonulocapsular diaphragm acts as a one-way valve. Fluid passes through the zonules and goes into the posterior chamber and pushes up the iris and the lens and you have a shallow anterior chamber. It could be either the fluid passing during your hydrodissection or IA or during FACO and or through a PC rent. The risk factors would be pseudoexfoliation, previous ocular trauma, radial tears in the anterior capsule, zonulysis, PC rent, or a small pupil or a na narrow angle which hides the peripheral capsular defect. Now, the steps where you could have it is practically every step during surgery. Hydrodissection, most often when you have a small pupil and you're doing blind hydrodissection, you're not going under the capsular rim, you're going above the capsular rim and you're pushing fluid through the zonules into the posterior chamber. Or phacoemulsification or a PC rent. It often happens during IA. Or even these days when we kind of hydro wash the PC for removing capsular tags over there, for cortical tags over there, that's when it happens. We, the jet is too strong. Management. This is very important. You need to counter this with a pressure with 
a swap stick or a Q-tip. Now, where do you put that pressure? You put the pressure at the incision. It serves multiple purposes. Even you put the pressure over there, it kind of seals the wound if it's a leak. It kind of presses the area of the ciliary body, pass planar, the section, the entire part, and it kind of reverses that uh, valve-like effect that the zonulo capsular diaphragm is causing. So that allows the fluid to kind of come, come back and the flow to reverse. And if there is supracoronal effusion or hemorrhage, it takes care of that by countering that pressure. So if you have applied pressure for five to 10 minutes and it becomes okay, you resume a low flow technique. If it's not okay, you need to do an indirect ophthalmoscopy or try to assess it somehow whether you have a cradle attachment and manage supracoronal effusion or hemorrhage. If there is no supracoronal, you're managing fluid misdirection syndrome. So the management, uh, this has been repeated in the journal of refractive surgery and you need to put, put a pass planar needle, a 23 gauge needle and aspirate 0.2 ml of fluid from behind the lens capsule in the retroventricular space or do a full blooded pass plan, or you can do a small core pa pass plan vitrectomy, 23 gauge vitrectomy, and that will take care of the fluid over there. Let's look at what the surgeon did over here. They somehow managed to deposit the iris. See the pressure on the table. You're trying to assess whether it's a hard eye or a soft eye. So that's a hard eye. So what do we need to do now? Here, the, uh, the supervising surgeon realized that a lot of fluid has been pushed into the bag and the area, so they're just con constantly decompressing the entire bag space. So, and the surgeon is constantly trying to check the pressure, whether it's um, come down, and decompression, pressing and pressing kind of regurgitates some amount of fluid, and the eye is softening, but it's not good enough. Iris prolapse has been reposited, but it's still not good enough. And then again, some more attempt to do that. And we are gaining some hold on the case, but it's still not really good enough. So we now go ahead and do a conjunctival incision, plan for a pass planar vitrectomy. That's an MVR blade, 23 gauge MVR blade goes in. You may not have time for a trocar and stuff like that, so, uh, or you may not have it available. So go in and with a 23 gauge vitrectomy, if you have enough visibility, fine, or else it's blind and you uh, go in the retroventricular space or in the mid vitreous and do a short vitrectomy and remove some part of the vitreous. You don't require to remove a great deal. Like I said, about 0.2 to 0.3 ml would probably serve the purpose. And then check the pressure. The pressure normalizes a little bit, or it's under control. You see now the anterior chamber is being formed. Yes. So now we have moved one step into safe zone and the pressure is still high, so the surgeon is not happy. Goes back again and does some more vitrectomy. And let me just skip this part, interest of time. And then we see, yes, now again the AC can be formed. Now viscoelastic, so the AC is well formed now. The pressure is controlled, so now close the port and go ahead and complete the surgery. 